Yep, so I'm here to talk about a project I've been working on for about a year now called Type Closure. And yeah, I'm Ambrose. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be giving some motivation why Type Closure exists and what kind of problems you can solve with it. And I'm going to just jump straight into some hands on getting started so you can start playing around with it yourself and hopefully with some REPL demos that don't go horribly wrong. So, as closure programmers, we like to um, verify our code as, as being correct, and generally we need a, a combination of different techniques to get higher confidence. So we've got things like unit testing, design by contract, and generative testing. And you, often we use these things in combination. So a popular one that I use is uh, unit testing and design by contract. They work very well together. They don't really conflict. Um, so one particular tool that's, uh, that's not well represented in the Clojure ecosystem is for static type checking. And that might seem obvious because Clojure is uh, designed to be a dynamically typed language, but there have been recent advancements in this field of research that uh, make this last question a good question. Can we build a tool that offers static type checking for Clojure? So before we wonder about that, so why would we want static type checking at all? So, um, I basically found these two use cases that, are, uh, that I, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that uh, type systems can help here. So um, one is that using programming in more abstract programming styles like uh, monadic code and uh, conduit code, and these are quite well suited to having static types. And another one that's probably uh, more practical is uh, Java interop, because Java is a statically typed language. Every time we call a method, a field, a constructor, we have static type information that we can, uh, we can look up. So that, that, that's really something that uh, other tools ha haven't taken. Um, uh, they don't use that information. And a type checker could use this. So if I was going to uh, build a type system for closure, what would it be like? So that the, the goals that I had for type closure um, was that I should understand most closure idioms. And that basically means that we, to, to port a bit of untyped code to be typed, we don't want to change its structure. We don't want to um, rewrite it. So it's basically going to be, um, we, add, we add type annotations, and that'll be sufficient uh, to type check it. And we also want to take advantage of existing closure code, um, allow some sort of mixing between typed and untyped code. We want to make sure type checking is optional as well, and that goes back to uh, my f first slides where I was talking about combining different testing techniques. So uh, basically, if, if type checking is not optional and we fail type checking, then we probably want to, I don't know, boot up a REPL or, or use design by contract or uh, use some combination of tools. So it has to be uh, completely optional um, to, to allow that to happen. And uh, another one of my goals was that I, I want to run on the the latest version of the Clojure compiler and not have to fork it. So, surprise, there's a, an existing project with almost all of these goals for another, um, another language called Type Racket. Um, and Type Racket is a sister language of, of Racket. And Racket, if you don't already know, is an implementation of a scheme. And um, Type Racket supports many Racket idioms. And it provides, uh, one of its novel features is that it uh, provides safe interoperability between typed and untyped code. And uh, this basically becomes a bit tricky when we, when we have untyped code, um, typed code calling untyped code, and we have a higher order function being passed in. And then if we get a type error at runtime, who do we, who do we blame? So there's, there's a blame calculus that um, basically covers all these cases. And there's an implementation of this calculus in um, type racket. So that's pr probably the most interesting thing about type racket. And if you want to learn more about that, see Tam Tobin Hochstadt's uh, awesome PhD dissertation. So type closure. Uh, type closure is an optional static type system for closure. It's uh, mostly based on type racket, and I've uh, put some closure specific extensions. And I've mainly built this for uh, two projects uh, my honors project for Bachelor of Computer Science. Uh, was supervised by Rowan Davies, and there's a accompanying uh, honors dissertation which I've submitted for marking and should be available at the end of the month. But uh, there is a link uh, in the type closure readme if you want to read it, uh, the, the version I submitted. And I also uh, made type closure a, uh, I proposed type closure as a Google Summer of Code project 2012, and I was mentored by David, which I see is in the back now. 
And um, yeah, thanks David for mentoring me. Uh, so this is the, the box as an arrow representation of what's going on in type closure. So on the left, we have some, some code coming in. So this is just raw forms, lists and vectors that represent uh, function invocations. So we're passing this into the closure compiler, which is the, the ugly Java compiler that uh, Chris alluded to. Uh, so the, one particular phase of the, the, the compiler is the analysis phase. And uh, usually you pass code into the, uh, when, you, when you perform compilation, it goes to the, through the analyzer and then you use the analysis results to emit Java bytecode. So uh, type closure takes, um, takes the result of analysis before emission. Um, which is an AST of Java objects, and then I pass it through uh, my little uh, analyze library, which basically gives me a closure script like um, a nested map representation of the AST, and uh, then type closure uh, performs type checking on that, that AST, and uh, the result is an AST with some extra static type information. I'm not sure how useful that is, but yeah, hopefully there's some more boxes that go off to the right in the future. So type closure is just a, just a library. It's uh, on closures, and there's this GitHub um, URL. So it, it, you just put it in line again, and you just start importing some vars, and that's, that's basically it. It's, it doesn't get much uh, more complicated than that. So there are, there are two main operations to run the type checker. The one that you use the most would be uh, the check NS, and that, that would, um, form type checking on a specific namespace. And the workflow would be you open up a REPL in a namespace and you, you would do your type annotations in your uh, regular, uh, over the top of your untyped code, and then you'd run check NS and it would check your namespace. So um, there's also another form called the CF check form, uh, and that's pretty handy for REPL development. Uh, you can pass it a form and it performs static type checking, or you can give it a form and a static type. So what do we need to annotate to get cl type closure to work? So there are the two usual rules with uh, things that use local type inference, which, uh, which type closure does. So the first rule uh, is that we need to uh, annotate all global vars that are referenced or defined in a type namespace. So when we come across a def or a defin in a type namespace, we have to already know an expected type. Um, and also function parameter types must be annotated and they're, they're never inferred. So if you don't annotate the, the type for a function parameter, it's just defaulted as any, which is the, the top type. It's kind of like object in Java, but it's slightly different to object in type closure and we'll see that later on. And many other positions can be inferred, uh, notably local bindings. Um, so th to annotate a var, you just um, use this an uh, function and uh, you, you, yeah, I might as well just bring up a REPL actually. So I'll show you what happens if you try and uh, check a definition that doesn't already have a, an expected type. We get this oh, lovely untyped var reference. So it's, it's saying I haven't found it a, a var, I haven't found a type associated with this var. So we can annotate it and say, okay, I want my, my function to be um, a function that's a number to a number. And then when type closure um, checks this definition, uh, it uses that expected type. And uh, this is the, basically what uh, code in type closure looks like. It's just normal code in the, in the black there, and this is some old core logic stuff that I found. It might not be in core logic anymore. Uh, but basically, uh, the thing to take away is that the bits in blue are the type annotations, and you haven't really had to change anything in, in the black. But uh, of course, you're gonna have to annotate some parts, but this is one example of what, what it might look like in a type namespace. So the other important, um, thing to annotate is, uh, is functions. So you have two, two main ways to annotate functions. So you can annotate a complete function type by using and form, and uh, this is useful for type checking closures anonymous function syntax, and for giving complete function types that have their, both the, the, the range and the, um, the, sorry, the parameters and the result type. And we can also infer the result in, uh, 
using the FN arrow, uh, FN arrow macro. And that basically allows us to just give the types of parameters and the result type is inferred. So we can check a, uh, uh, an anonymous function. So you say one that takes a, uh, a single argument and just adds one to it. And we can say, okay, we expect this to be, again, a boring number to number. And I should just note that um, this number is, is the Java Lang number, and it's, it's, it's scoped that way because that's how closure is scoped. Uh, the, the, you have Java Lang star is imported. Uh, so yeah, we reuse the, uh, the imports that, uh, that the current namespace can see. And I've actually got a bunch of imports here as well, the closure lang symbol and all that. So this is in scope when I, when I write my types. So let's just run this. So yeah, it, it'll, uh, there's also a shorthand for REPL development. Uh, you can also give the expected type as the uh, second argument to CF. And, and also the, the, the uh, function shorthand, we can uh, just say we've got a, a function with one argument, which is a number, and then infer the result type. It's, there's extra information here, but this is the main bit here. It's a function with a, a number to a number. And yeah, all the, the usual stuff is supported with the FN arrow, but I recommend using and form almost always, except for when you have functions that are so short that you'd probably use the anonymous function syntax. But if you are, then you need and form anyway. So yeah, it's, it's just there uh, for very specific cases. So type closure supports union and intersection types. And in particular, we have an un untagged union type. And uh, a union type is a, it's a, it's, it's a type uh, with a set of functions. And uh, an expression is of that type if, if it is of at least one of the members of that, um, of that union. And the, uh, the dual of that is the intersection type. And if an expression is of an intersection type, it is of, it must be at least, yeah, it must be a subtype to each one of its members. So I'll just um, show an example for that. So if we have a, a type one, we can assign it the union type, either nil or number. Because one is a number, then that's a valid thing to do. Uh, we can also say one is uh, it's the intersection of a, a long and a number, because it's, it's both of those things. But, um, but yeah, because one is a Java Lang long. But if we say if it's a Java Lang integer, then we get a type error, because it's, it's not a Java Lang integer, even though it is a number. So this is some code I've taken from Algo Monads, and it's for those interested, it's the M bind of the maybe Monad, and uh, it's basically um, an interesting case of using unions and, and function types. So um, it takes it's a function that takes two arguments. If you see in, in the, the the black code there, uh, and the the, the type of the first argument is uh, it's either nil or it's an x, and the x here is uh, uh, it's a universally quantified uh, type variable, which means that we read the, the all x, y as for all types x and y, then this. Um, so we've got a, MV is either a union of, uh, sorry, it's a union of x or um, nil. And then f is a higher order function. So we, we write that x, x actually takes the, um, sorry, f takes the x and returns a union of nil and y then the return type corresponds to the, the body. So you, we can return a, either nil or y. So we can uh, abbreviate type, types by defining type aliases. And uh, we can also parameterize our type aliases by, uh, by using type functions, which are basically functions at the type level. And uh, for example, we have this any integer alias, which is included in the type uh, closure. And this is basically representing the type that, uh, the, the, the types that would return true for the closure core integer question mark 
uh, predicate in, uh, in Closure JVM. Uh, so Java lang integer long big, in, big integer short byte. So it's just a, an abbreviation and you, you'd write any integer. So a bit of an ad hoc hacky option type, but it basically um, models the way that, that Closure uses the option type is, uh, is using this, this type function here. So this type function, it takes an x and then returns uh, the union of, of nil and x. So if we call option with any integer, then it's just like a function call, except x is now a type. So uh, any integer is passed as x, and then um, x is instantiated as any integer. So these two types are equivalent. Yep, so a bit more about universal quantification. Um, I think I've covered everything, actually. Uh, but there's a, a, the type for sum. Uh, it, it's, it was pretty similar to the one we saw before, uh, parameterizing over uh, two, two types. And we can very often uh, infer what these type, uh, type parameters are, but if we, for some reason we can't infer it, we use the inst form to manually instantiate a polymorphic type. So we can just check, check the types that we have already just by, um, by looking up uh, with, with, uh, with CF, and here's a badly formatted uh, type signature for sum. And we can, if you just notice that it's, it's, it's got a, it's universally quantified at the moment, but we can pass this to inst um, just to choose them short um, types. We can instantiate it, and all the x's are replaced with ints, and all the y's are replaced with uh, booleans. But usually, you don't, we don't have to do this, uh, and this is inferred using local type inference. So type closure uses ordered function, uh, ordered intersection types, uh, and this is, it, type, type racket uses this, and it basically allows us to, to specify multiple arities and multiple combinations of parameter and return types in a single function type. And the way it works is when you check a definition with a function type, each, each arity must, must type check for that definition. And uh, when you invoke a function that has a, a, an ordered intersection function type, it, it kind of works like a pattern match. So if you invoke a function and you know the types of the parameters you're passing, you just check each one of the, the arities against, uh, against the parameter types you're giving it. And the first one uh, takes precedence. Uh, over the, the following ones. So th this actually becomes crucial for typing things like uh, the sequence uh, abstraction, like first. Uh, so first has three cases. Uh, well, the, the actual semantics of first are, if we pass nil to first, we get nil. If we pass an empty collection to first, we get nil. And if we pass a non-empty collection, we get the, the element, the first element. So the first case of this function intersection type handles the case where we either pass a, a, a nil or, a, or, a, or an empty collection. So if we read it from the left of the, uh, the red, red box, we have either a union, or that is, we have a union that is nil, or it's an intersection of a seekable x and exact count zero. So exact count zero is the type for, for sequences that are empty. And if we match this, we can safely say it's always going to return nil. And uh, nil is the, the type for nil in, in type closure. And the, the, second, uh, pr the second arity says if we have a type that, um, that is both a seekable x and is a, a count range one or is, has a count greater than one, then we always get uh, the, the, the type that seekable is parameterized by. And usually with a function intersection type, you'd have your most general type at the bottom. So it's kind of a catch-all case. So this, this is, the union of nil and seekable x is more general than, than the other ones. And it, it describes all the possible ways to use first. And uh, also the, the, uh, the result type is the most general out of those, uh, the union of nil and x. So we have a, a, 
an inference strategy called occurrence typing, which was developed for type racket. And one of the key things about recurrence typing is that you can add extra propositions to results of, uh, the result types of functions. And there are two, you can add two propositions in particular. Uh, you have the then proposition, and that is, is used if the result of the test, sorry, if the, if the result of the expression that you get back is true, and the else proposition is used if the result of the expression is false. I'll just give an example for that. Actually, first, uh, here's, here's the seek type, and uh, seek uses occurrence typing to, uh, to convey the, uh, the length of, of a sequence. So we know that if, if we get, uh, if we get a, a true value from seek, we know that its parameter is of count range one, or it has, has one or more count. And uh, if, we, if we get a, a negative, if we get a false value from calling seek, we know that either, um, so the way to, to read these propositions is that the is is a positive proposition. So, uh, and then the, the, uh, the, the number of the parameter is on the right. So we say uh, either the zeroth argument is nil, or it's, it's an exact count of zero, so, or it's empty. So these two functions actually work quite well in harmony uh, in type closure uh, in the way you'd expect. So let's make a local binding A and uh, just assign it the, the, the vector with just one in it. Let's give it a, a, a less general type so type closure can recover what type it or, uh, originally was. So let's just say it's a seekable of number. So if we, if we test on seek of A, we should know that if we go down the then branch, it's of count one or more, otherwise it's empty, right? So, so let, let's say I just, I, I just want to return some number. So let's say if, if we're going down the then branch, it's going to be uh, one, Otherwise, let's return zero, and let's say the expected type is a number. So this type checks, but we can, we can ch look at what types are actually inferred for, uh, for each branch by using printenv. So printenv uh, takes a debug string and then just prints stuff out to the standard output. Uh, and let's do it for both, uh, both branches. So printenv... Um, some reason prints everything twice, which I haven't got around to fixing, but uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. And when I was doing this, I found a bug, so I'll just explain. So we're, we're down the then branch. Let's just get a little more. When we're down the the, the then branch, uh, we know that A is going to be non non empty. So the the type for A down the then branch is actually the intersection of seekable number and count range one. So that we've actually got a more accurate type here. But the, the bug I was talking about is that uh, down the else branch, we haven't actually updated the type, but we have a proposition environment and we've added these, these propositions here, here should look somewhat familiar from, uh, from the else of uh, seek. So except for saying the zeroth argument, we've actually instantiated the, the zero with A. So uh, we have the two propositions that A is nil and uh, A is, is empty. Uh, so yeah, at, right now I'm not updating the type. So, so the, the main thing is that uh, with printend we can do some static debugging and m just check out the types and propositions that are currently in scope. So type closure uh, uses some of the theory from type racket to types to express types about variable arity functions. And there are two main kinds of, well, I guess keyword parameters are the ugly one. But the two nicer kinds are uh, uniform variable arity and non-uniform variable arity. So uniform variable arity is where you have a rest a rest parameter that can be expressed with just just some type, like Say plus and minus is just any number of in, uh, any number of numbers, 
but a, a non-uniform variability has a, um, has a non-trivial relationship between its arguments. So functions like map and swap bang um, have non-trivial uh, relationships. So for, with map, for example, as, as the uh, rest parameters grow to the right, uh, the, our first uh, argument to map has to match, match the number of rest parameters by the, the number of parameters you have in your first argument. So we can express this with a, a theory called variable arity polymorphism. Uh, but the, the two types for uh, using just the normal uh, uniform variable arity, we have closure core divide here, and the way we express it is that divide must take at least one argument, so we say, okay, we've got a number, but we've also got a number star, and that's any number of numbers, zero or more, and, and then we return a number. And uh, constantly takes, uh, takes some type x, and then returns a type, it returns a function that takes any number of, of y's, and then uh, returns an x. So we'll, there's the star again. So I'm not gonna completely explain how this works, but the, the gist of the type for map is that we have a, a dotted type variable that's scoped with the, uh, the dots. Um, so B is in scope as a dotted type variable, and that, that means that we can put it to the right of, uh, of dots. Uh, and the dots can only, only appear to the left of an arrow, immediately to the left. So there are two sides to the dots. The, the, on the right, we have, uh, we have the bound in blue, and on the left, we have the, uh, the pre-type uh, in, in red. And the subtlety here is that uh, the B is actually in scope as a regular type variable in the red. But don't worry about that. The cool thing is that you can do something like this. So we're mapping over these two collections, uh, and this is just untyped at the moment, um, but we say we just want to get the first argument uh, and just return it. So we'd, uh, let's allocate some types. So the cool thing is we've inferred uh, a, a pretty accurate type for that, and we also haven't needed to redundantly give the type for map. There's just one type for map, and that expresses all the possible ways of using map. <laughs> yes, this is a research by Steve Strickland uh, and uh, Felaysen, Sam Tobin Hodgstadt at Northeastern University. Really cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we can express maps with known keyword keys as heterogeneous map types. And it, the, uh, the main thing to know about these types at the moment is that they only record the presence of keyword keys, uh, but not their absence. So this buys us a soch, uh, associating keys, a dissoch, uh, get, but not merge, because uh, as we merge, say we're mer merging three maps, the, the maps on the right, if we don't know that keys don't exist, then they could overwrite keys that, that we want to be certain types. So uh, th this, this theory gets pretty complicated, but OCaml is just a, a treasure trove for this, and I've, I've managed to avoid any of the, the, the complications. My supervisor is an OCaml nut, so he's given me a whole big list of things to read. Uh, so I'll be busy next year. <laughs> but we get, here's a type for the, uh, the reflection interface for, uh, for closure. Closure has the uh, closure reflect namespace, and we have this closure reflect uh, slash type reflect function. And it takes a class and then returns a map with uh, three keys, these flags, bases, and members. And um, yeah, well, we, can, we can define an alias that, uh, that represents this map, and then we, the, the actual type for the type reflect 
uh, is right there. But the thing to, to note is that I haven't got around to adding keyword parameters, so it's just any star. But it's interesting to note that I have heterogeneous map types, uh, which is probably enough to, uh, to implement uh, keyword parameters. So I'll be, I'll be thinking about how to implement that in the next few months. But hopefully it won't be too hard. Uh, so let's just show you how this works. Uh, so let's reflect on the, the object uh, class. So the type we get back is a, um, is a reflect map. Uh, and we, we saw the type for that over here. So what we can do is we can, uh, we can look it up and we've got a, uh, the, the type that we expect. Uh, so yeah, we've got get, there's get. Uh, Oh, there was one really cool example, actually. Just give me a second. Let's find it. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is cool. Right, so we can... So let's get all the members that are methods. So we can define an, a, uh, uh, sorry, a, a predicate called method uh, question mark. And using this, this type here, it basically gives you the propositions that if this returns true, then we know that, that the first argument is a method. If it returns false, then we know that it's not a method. And then um, we can give this, uh, give this class methods fun function that takes a reflect map and then returns all the, the methods. So the interesting thing here is that we've destructured the uh, RS, which is the reflect map. We've taken the members. Then we've filtered over the members, um, testing if it's an instance of method. Then we've given it a set, and then we get this extremely, uh, amazingly accurate type here. Uh, so this is all, all occurrence typing. Uh, with a bit of uh, heterogeneous maps, and yeah, I think that is pretty awesome. Uh, th that's one of the best use cases for occurrence typing. Uh, just th th the idea that you can recover types in this in this filter is is pretty awesome. Yep. So we can an uh, give types to data types and protocols, and uh, this is. I'm not sure of the best way to do this at the moment, but basically with protocols, you can annotate each method, uh, even the first argument as you'd like, because there are problems between it when you, uh, but you want some sort of type inheritance between protocols sometimes, because you just, you, you need to know some extra information. Uh, so that's kind of a, a problem I, I, I need to look at uh, as well. Uh, I won't elaborate on that at the moment, but say if we have a data type, uh, a closure reflect field, uh, we can annotate expected data types, uh, types for data types and other namespaces um, using the and data type form. Uh, and this also works in, for data types in your own namespace, but the difference is that if it's in your own namespace, then it's gonna be type checked, but the, the definition will be type checked, but if if it's not, then the definition won't be. So, yeah, so, so closure reflect field has four fields, has the name type, declaring class, and flags, and we've given the, the types for, the, uh, for each of the field. And uh, type closure allows us to, to perform type checking on constructors, just uh, the, the raw dot form, or the, uh, the arrow form, uh, just thinking. I don't think the map arrow form is supported at the moment. But actually, the um, records don't actually, aren't supported at the moment, actually. Uh, it, field is a record, but it's also a data type, so we can get away with, uh, with uh, looking up the field of, uh, of this. Oh, 
I chose the wrong name for field. Everything is field, field, field. <laughs> oh, man. But anyway, we've got a, the, the, the field name, FLD name, def there is a symbol because we've, we've looked it up and type closure can infer that um, knowing that FLD is a field and we've looked up the, uh, the, the field. <laughs> so this, this is one of my favorite bits of type closure, the Java interoperability. So um, we utilize Java static, inf uh, JATIC, <laughs> Java static type information uh, when we interact with Java. And the, probably the most interesting part is that uh, nil is separated as a static type from null. So in Java, when you have a reference type, the compiler thinks, great, it could be null at any point. And uh, you're on your own. Make sure you just don't do it wrong. Good luck. But type closure tries to go a little bit further uh, and, and separates nil and, uh, and reference types. And uh, this all works pretty nicely with, uh, with occurrence typing, which is actually the, the crucial, crucial part. And uh, say we have a, a, a Java I.O. file and we, we, we run, we instantiate a new uh, instance of it. Uh, with the, uh, the name A. So a constructor, just, just normal Java constructors don't ever return null. That's just one of the guarantees that Java gives you. And type closure recognizes this. So by default, or just all the time, uh, constructors are, are never null. So you just have to say F is a file. And type closure agrees with you, sure. So by default, uh, method invocations uh, aren't nullable. And uh, this is because type closure takes the most conservative uh, approach and just assumes uh, that, that all methods can return null. So uh, this is actually semantically correct for the get parent method of uh, f, uh, of, of file. Because if we, don't, if we haven't defined a parent, then it returns null. If we have, then it returns a string. So this is actually a, a, a decent type for this. But get name is uh, always returns its name. So it's always a string. So it's never null. So what we need to do, we need to add a, a, an assumption to uh, type closures database of assumptions. And we use this, uh, this function non nil return. And it, it takes a uh, a, a symbol representing a Java method, and uh, then uh, so that the, the second argument to non neural return is either the keyword all for all arities, or it's a set of integers. Uh, the integers uh, correspond to the, the arity that you're talking about. And then type closure remembers okay, if we're looking up the Java IO file get name for, uh, for any arity, then we know that it's not going to return nil. And um, this is actually a, uh, just a, a static assumption. And that if it really does return null, then type closure isn't really helping you. And uh, this is a good motivation uh, for adding a, a runtime check for, for say, a, a debug mode of, of closure. And uh, you could add a, a null uh, check around this uh, get name. Yeah, just to make sure that uh, null never gets uh, never gets called in, and we've seen the, the static debugging with a print end. Uh, I don't think I've shown filter set. So this go back to our example here. Um, we can also work out which propositions. Uh, an expression is going to add to the environment if we if we go print filter set. If I can remember how to use it, debug string. So it takes a debug string and uh, and a form, and it it to to closure it's as if you just pass that seek a, but to type closure it'll um, it'll print out uh, a debug string here. Let's get rid of the. Duplicate. All right, so here we are. The the two propositions that are that are going to be um, so 
remember we're looking at this expression here and we're asking which propositions are attached to this, uh, that uh, expression. And the answer is that we have a filter set with the then proposition of uh, if it's true, then A is a count range one, and if it's false, then it's either nil or exact count zero. And we can also, another and form is very useful for uh, static debugging as well. So say if we, was, we weren't quite sure that first was gonna be a number here, we would add uh, and form number. Uh, and yeah, it might not look like it, but that did statically type check. It's a, a bit too zoomed in to see. Uh, but there are actually parts where closure isn't, isn't quite, um, it's a bit too flexible to be, for type closure to, to catch all misuses. Is that it? <laughs> all right, that's it, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>